they're missing. Man, kind of kind of takes the picture down a notch, doesn't it? It doesn't look as good. Well, what if I happen to have something that might help here in my pocket? Let's see, I got two pieces. Yeah, see if you can put those in there. See if you can figure that out. And there she goes. Those two pieces really help that picture look better, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? Now, here's what I want you to know, though. When it comes to the Bible, there is nothing missing. That the Bible is complete. It is whole. There's not a piece missing where it doesn't give us the full picture of of, of, of God or how we fit into it or anything. It is a complete picture. And that's what you're going to be learning about today is that the Bible is complete and whole and we can trust it for to carry us along. I need somebody to carry this for Miss Stacy. Who would, who would you do that? You got such a beautiful smile. Can I pray for you? Hold on, hold on. Let's pray. Let's pray. She's ready to go. She's excited. I might go with you. I hear they have more fun in the back than the guy who preaches up here. Sometimes I fall asleep when he's preaching. No, I'm just kidding. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these boys and girls. We thank you, God, how you have brought them to this place, given us the opportunity to minister to them. We pray, Father, that they will grow to know that your word is the foundation, that your word is complete, and they can trust that. Be with Miss Stacy and Mr. Ben as they fight those two things today. May you encourage them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen girls. I need you out here. <laughs> in the name of Jesus. I like her. <laughs> I might just get her to stay out here and help me preach. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. Woo. Getting up this morning was a little harder than last week. It'll be a little easier tomorrow morning when it comes Monday. Just so you know, if you are interested, we are beginning a Bible study on, on Wednesday night on heaven. And we would love for you to come. We're going to be answering common questions about heaven. And we're going to answer them biblically. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of the things that we kind of think and believe because of tradition or things we've heard. And I can tell you that uh, we're going to debunk the idea that people become angels when they die, that you only float around on a cloud playing a harp. Those are not biblical ideas, but we're going to look at what the Bible says about heaven. Because here's what I, I will tell you. The more you know about heaven, the better your life will be on earth. Because the enemy wants you to think about everything else except for eternity. Because if he can make you think about here more than heaven, then you won't be sharing with people about Jesus. You won't be living that life of joy, and he will have you right where he wants you so that you're not effective for the kingdom. So I encourage you to come on Wednesday nights right here in this room to a study on heaven. Open your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Today's message might be more toward me than anybody else in this room because I've had issues in my life of kind of being prideful sometimes, Tim. For instance, there's this time many years ago when I was a, how I, I had graduated from high school and I had an opportunity to buy a Mustang. Man, this was a, <laughs> Mr. Merck, this was a black Mustang, tinted windows, shotgun customs, 302 boss engine with a rem remote control radio that I could reach and touch, but it was cool to have a remote control to use. Man, I thought I was hot stuff, Mr. Don. I mean, I thought I was something. I was driving this car around, and I was, you know, I was, I was young, foolish. Man, I wanted the girls to look at me. I had to have a car to get girls to look at me. <laughs> but I had this car, and I thought I was something. Man, I'd drive that thing around. <clears throat> now, I'm going to confess something this morning. Now, this isn't the way I drive now, Mr. Hopwood. But listen, I did drive it and got it over 120 miles per hour one time, and um, I have since repented, okay? But I thought I was something with this Mustang. One day going to work, I was behind a Corvette, and I thought I was in a league of my own. I have a Mustang, they got a Corvette. It's happening, man. I have arrived. And I'm tinted windows driving down through there. 
right behind this Corvette on, on uh, 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 you know where Green Ford is? All right, the Corvette pulled over and uh, into the turning lane right, just like I needed to, and I was right on that Corvette's tail. I was something, Gene. Corvette turns left between Green Ford and the Mercury Place there, and I just went right in behind it. I'm all right. Unfortunately, I didn't see the car coming. I was all prideful and thought I, I had it together because I had a Mustang. And it did not negate the fact that there was a car coming and hit me head on. By the way, you can't turn left there anymore. It was right after my wreck that they stopped you from turning left. So you can thank me later that I've made that area safer. <laughs> but in my pride, I thought I was something. And God had to hand me a little humble pie that day. I thought I had the car, I had the life. I had a sense of pride, and God brought me down a notch. You know, sometimes we look for, we look for a brand name in clothes or shoes so that we can be noticed, that we can reach a level or a status. We look for a car to drive or a truck so that people will look up to us and place us on a pedestal. We, we look at where our kids go to school. For those who love sports, it's the name on the jersey, isn't it? When you get your jersey, you wear it, and you want, hey, look at me. Especially if it's autographed. You want to tell the story. Man, my favorite person autographed this jersey. We live in a world where we have a tendency to go toward that idea that we want to do things that make us big and great. But what did Jesus say about that? How are we to live based on what Jesus has said in Scripture? I can tell you that the word pious is from the 15th century, and that is a, 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 a word that carries with it a positive and a negative meaning. Pious or piety can be that you're, you're devoted religiously, that you're faithful, but it can also mean that you have a condescending, condescending way about you. So today, when we talk about humbling piety, we're going to be talking about it in two respects. How to have that devotion and that faithfulness in your religion and your focus on God. And then also, how if you get so prideful in your life, so much piety built up about yourself, that God is going to humble you. We're going to find that in Scripture today. In the book of Luke, it's written by a man by the name of Luke. He's a doctor. He's, he really pays attention to details. He's writing to a gentleman by the name of Theophilus, we can see in chapter 1, verse 4. He's wanting to write concerning the things that he's heard about Jesus and give him a, an accurate account of what really took place. Now today we come across something that's only found in the book of Luke. There's a healing that takes place that's only found here in Luke. You can't find it in any of the other Gospels. The scene is this. Jesus has been teaching and one of the Pharisees has invited him into his home. Now, oftentimes, that would take place. Whenever there'd be someone that would be a teacher who would be speaking, they would invite that person into their home for a meal. Anybody want to invite your speaker to your home today for some chicken? or, or, or Come on, come on now, let's get biblical. <laughs> okay, you can ta take us out to eat. No, uh, I'm just kidding. But the whole idea there was that they would take the special guest, bring them into their home, and they would feed them, and then they, they got to talk to them some more and things of that nature. So we see in chapter 14, verse 1, that it says, It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. Now, I don't want you to miss this at all. It happened that one of the leaders of the Pharisees said, Come into my house. I want you to come eat with me today. And don't miss the fact of how they saw each other. When it came to the Pharisees and Jesus, they didn't necessarily have a good relationship. As a matter of fact, this is the third time that Jesus will heal on the Sabbath. Now, each time Jesus is healed on the Sabbath, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the, all the religious people did not like it because they believed that you were not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. But here is Jesus invited into a Pharisee's home on the Sabbath 
and Jesus is theirs. Look at verse 2. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Now what is dropsy? Dropsy is, uh, today you might call it edema, where you have parts of your body that gets too much fluid in it. Where it might be your elbows or your knees. Have you ever had that happen to you? I mean, uh, sometimes it hurts, doesn't it? It has a lot of pain. This particular individual, it was obvious this was going on. One of the reasons that you can have this fluid build up in your body is because of heart failure. Congestive heart failure will, will cause that. Whatever was the cause, here was a man who was suffering from a health problem right in front of Jesus. Now, was this man planted to be in front of Jesus to see what Jesus was going to do? We don't know. Was this man a servant in the house of the Pharisees? We don't know. But what we do know is that this man was right in front of Jesus according to verse 2. And Jesus had a choice and an option to either pay attention to the man in front of him or pay attention to all those who held the elite status in society around them and try to win over their, their kindness and kind of be good to them. Let's see what Jesus chose. And Jesus answered. By the way, do you read where there was a question? It says that Jesus answered, but it, we, we don't see that there was a question. I believe there was a question hanging in the air. Have you ever been in a room where there was an elephant? You know, there's something that everybody knows, but nobody is saying it. I believe there was a question. And the question was this, what's Jesus going to do? It's the Sabbath. What is he going to do with this guy? And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? He just threw, threw out a question. And he says, but they kept silent. And he took hold of them, him, and healed him and sent him away. Jesus asked them a question to see exactly what side they were going to fall on, and they were quiet. They didn't say anything. So one of the things that we need to look at very closely and what we see here about this story is we see that Jesus is surrounded by people filled with a piety, that they know better than everybody else, that they have arrived. Let's look at what Jesus did. Let's, let's examine this and write this down today. The first thing Jesus did was he prioritized people. You know, many times in our life, we want to prioritize other things rather than the importance of someone else. But we see in verses 2 through 4 that Jesus prioritized the man who needed something in front of him. Those who were filled with religious piety and they were proud and they had the elite status in society, Jesus wasn't focused on them first, he was focused on the one that was in need. How oftentimes do we want to be popular and we'll do whatever we, we can do to gain the, the approval of someone else? Jesus didn't work that way. We see that this man who once was sick is healed by Jesus. And the other thing that I believe that we can see, not only did he prioritize people, he addressed the heart and the attitudes of the people who were there. So Jesus didn't just address the one who needed healing, he addressed those who were around him as well. Because we can see this as we look at verses 3 through 6. We know that he, he asked, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath or not? They're silent. And then Jesus actually heals the man, verse 5. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox or a donkey fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to him. See, Jesus began to address the heart and the attitude of the problem that was in the room. Last week we, we talked about conflict and how in, in conflict we need to focus on others and serve others. Jesus here, he's not focused on the law that is being uh, put up above people. He is focusing on the heart of the person that is in front of him that needed healing at that moment. And these people, they are thinking, Jesus, you are, you are a heretic because you're healing on the Sabbath. What kind of sense does that make? That somebody would think that it was wrong to be healed on the Sabbath. But these men, these people thought that it would be wrong to do that. 
but Jesus is challenging them, and he brings it home personally. See, a lot of times we'll take a stand on something until it becomes very personal in our lives, don't, don't we? Well, well, we'll stand up and say, yeah, we need to side with this person un until it becomes very personal and begins to affect us, and then we kind of back off sometimes. That's what's going on with these people. Jesus is saying, uh, which one of you, if your son fell in a di ditch or he needed help on the Sabbath, which one of you would not help him? They all were quiet because they knew that they would help their son on the Sabbath. So Jesus is, is, is bringing it to the point that, well, 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 what's the difference if that's the case? He addressed their heart and their attitude about this man who needed compassion and mercy, not a list of laws in his life. So let's look at the Christ-centered truth today about what Jesus wants them to understand. Because if he's addressing their heart and he's wanting to teach them, he's going to do more than just ask a question. Look at verse 7. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table. See, these people were coming in trying to find the best place in the room to sit, not so that they could see, but so that other people could see them. That's an important point here for you to understand. It wasn't for them to be able to see Jesus. They wanted other people to see them where they were sitting. They wanted to be sitting next to the host, the one who had the highest clout in the room. They wanted to be the one that everybody would look at and say, well, he must be best friends with the head honcho. If you walk into a room and the president and CEO of a company is standing there and next to him is a man, then that man probably has a lot of clout. And that's what they were baking, banking on, is that if people look at me because of where I'm sitting, I'm going to be important. Let's see what Jesus had to say about that in this parable. See, in a parable, it teaches a general attitude. He's not going to address our manners at the table. Okay, It's a parable. He's teaching us something through it. He says to them, verse 8, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for someone, someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this man. And, to the, and then, in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Let me tell you something. A Christ-centered heart honors God. That is a truth that you can take to the bank. It is written in the Word. It is very clear. A Christ-centered truth, or a Christ-centered heart, seeks honor from God and not men. See, these people were trying to place themselves in a place of honor. They wanted to lift them own, their own self up. They wanted to promote themselves. They wanted to climb the ladder and be something important. The bottom line is that believers were not to seek status or greatness from other people, but to seek it from God. A Christ-centered heart seeks to honor God first and foremost. It seeks to see that God honors you. And in this life and in your everyday routines of whatever it is, whether it's school, whether it's work, whether it's at home, wherever, we have to be careful not to pick ourselves up and put ourselves up on a pedestal because I can tell you there may be a car coming that's going to humble you when you think everything is good. I think the second thing that we can see in the Christ-centered truth is a Christ-centered attitude puts other people first. See, the seat closest to the host was the best seat in the house for it had the greatest honor outside of the host in the room. And this is a Pharisee's house, so everybody's clamoring to look good. But can I tell you something? If where we sit makes us important, then you're really not important. Can I say that again? I don't think that somebody got it. I, I know we're all a little tired this morning because of the changing of the time, but you need to get this. If where we sit makes us important, we're not really important. That has to do with this room. 
If where you sit in this room, think, if you think it makes you important, then you're really not as important as you think you are. Because a chair in a seat does not make us important. It's what God sees us as that makes us important. And when we think that we can make ourselves important by sitting somewhere or being in a certain place or knowing someone, we're not really that important. See, at Chicopee, we want every individual to be treated as important. Because I'm here to tell you, I think every, every person in this room is important. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're important. Everybody in here is important. You are important. And it's not based on where you're sitting that makes you important. You're important because Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, died on a cross, so that you could be here today. That's what makes you important. So a seat of status is not what Jesus is teaching in this parable that we should be looking for. Third thing is this. A Christ-centered life pursues serving others, serving without benefits. Now this is going to be the hard hitting right here. Look at verse 11 for me. I don't want you to miss this. This is... Look in, look in your copy of the Word, because this is not easy. I can testify this is true because of my Mustang that I put in the grave. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There is a difference between being humiliated and being humble. When we exalt ourself, we're, we are in a position where we have to be humiliated so that we can become humble. And so Jesus is teaching a very important point. That is a promise. You can draw a line under it or circle it or put promise to the side. This is a moral promise that Jesus says, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. But he doesn't stop there. He continues on with the next parable. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him. So he's talked to the people who are gathered around, the guests who have come into the room trying to find a place where, ooh, look at me, I am so good, I know this guy, we are close, we're like this. You need to be my friend. He's addressed those people, now he's going to turn his attention to the host in the room. And he says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your payment. Hold on a second. That doesn't sound so bad, does it? I mean, in, in inviting your family, your friends, your rich neighbors, and them inviting you back, that sounds all right. I mean, sounds like a good truth to live by, but Jesus is saying don't do that? What does this mean? It's because he's having to address a heart issue and an attitude that is within them that needs to be gotten out there's nothing wrong with inviting your friends or your neighbors or your relatives it's your attitude it's your motive in which you're doing it that makes the difference see Jesus goes on to say but when you give a reception invite the poor the crippled the lame the blind And you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Pharisees believed that there was going to be a resurrection. The Sadducees did not. That's an important context to know in Scripture that whenever Jesus encounters the Sadducees, they don't believe there is a resurrection. But the Pharisees do believe there's a resurrection. So he is saying this in the midst of some people who understand theologically there's going to be a resurrection. But what he is addressing is here are the Pharisees who have lived their life that the crippled, the lame, they don't go into the temple to worship. They had to stay in the outer court. They couldn't pass through the gate called beautiful. They had to just lay and beg for money. They were the outcasts of society. How dare Jesus come to them and say, don't invite your rich friends or your neighbors or your friends or those who are okay. Invite those that are outcasts from the temple. 
See, Jesus is addressing a hard issue that they have because they want to be great in society. They want to look good, and they want to do everything they can to lift themselves up. But Jesus is saying there are people who need compassion and mercy. See, Jesus is turning everything upside down. One man said this, if we give only because it pays, it won't really pay. If we only serve because it pays, it really isn't going to pay. Here's what Jesus is addressing. Whatever you do, do it expecting nothing in return. See, here's, here's a truth. But I'm going to brag on Chicopee in a second so y'all don't, y'all don't uh, get upset. Churches that only serve people so that they can get more people in the church to tithe are not God's churches. People who only serve so that they can get something in return are not serving for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They're serving for themselves. Jesus is declaring that we as believers need to be the ones serving the poor, the afflicted, the downcast, the hurting. It's us, not the government of the United States of America. Jesus has declared that it's us, the believers in Jesus Christ. It's not a governmental program. It is Jesus' program that those who are hurting should be served by those who have been born again. Sorry, I got a little excited there, didn't I? But this is a point that Jesus is making. If we at Chicopee begin to think that we're only going to serve those who can give back to this church, we are going to be walking away from Jesus and saying, we don't want to do it Jesus' way, we want to do it our way. But here's the good news. Here's where I want to brag on you. Here's some things that I have learned and some things that's going on here at Chicopee. Next month, Chicopee is going to be hosting an egg hunt at Harrison Square Apartments in Gainesville. Why is that important? It's a very impoverished area. Poor, poor children. And you know what we're going to get out of doing that? Nothing here on earth. We're going to do it because those kids need to know that there is a God in heaven who loves and cares for them in their condition. That's why we're going to do it. We have a van. We have... We have men, we have, we have a great man that I love very much who shows up early on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, gets in that van, he takes somebody with him, he's already taken my son, thank you, and goes and picks up some kids in a local trailer park who go to bed hungry more than you have meals. Some of them were, some of them were up here just a minute ago. Do you understand, last Sunday, right over there, there were kids in this room that had never, ever been in a church service before. Stacy had to tell them what was that thing that they were passing around, people were putting money in. Why are people standing up? Why are people sitting? These kids had never been in a church service. Do you know what we're going to get out of that? Nothing here on earth, but praise God, there are things going to happen in the kingdom of God in heaven. When we are involved in building His kingdom rather than our kingdom, then God is glorified and not us. Okay, that's just two things. This church has supplied back to school supplies for those kids when they had nothing. It's a story of one boy, Stacy took him shopping for shoes. And he was looking at shoes on a rack. He loved them, but he put them back. He said, they're not my size. This little boy all his life had to settle for whatever was on the rack because they were all used. Had never had a new pair of shoes that he could look at and say, I like this pair. You mean they got different sizes and I get to pick my size? The children's ministry are sponsoring two kids. The kids back there are bringing in their money to sponsor kids overseas. You can see these two children on our webpage under ministry and children where there's two different kids being sponsored by those kids back there in another country. The kids back there on Wednesday night, they're bringing 
Grocery bags, Kroger bags, Walmart bags. Why? For the local Good Samaritan food ministry. They're bringing these bags and they're sorting them and they're getting them over there. Can I, can, we live in a bubble sometimes. You understand the Good Samaritan Food Ministry here in Hall County that's a, connected to the Chattahoochee Baptist Association, when you tithe, a portion of your tithe goes to that ministry. But in 2016, they served over 22,000 children food. They served over a million pounds of food to the needy in this county. When you leave today and you go home to eat, there are going to be people who are going to be hungry. Not in another country, but in our back door. And I thank God that there are people here in this church who are involved in that ministry, who volunteer over there at that ministry, who preach over there at that ministry, who helps do things over there. We as a church, we give to help support that ministry. There's other ministries in the area. Great Street Revolution has a thing called Backpack Love. Do you know they need 720 boxes of macaroni and cheese every week? Every week. That is only 360 backpacks to put those macaroni and cheese in because they put two in every backpack. And that does not even scratch the surface of the children in our community going home hungry. They do not have enough people to help them and, and help get these backpacks together and get the food together to feed every hungry child in Hall County in the school system. But they're doing what they can. There are people in this church who are involved in rescuing women who are in the sex trafficking industry. Going and giving them a ride to a place that's safe. Serving in the ministry. We have a Sunday school class that takes up money every week for the Backpack Love and Straight Street Revolution and for Beautiful Feet and things of that nature. And everything I have mentioned we may never see one penny of tithe from it. And I thank God for it because we're fulfilling what Jesus said. Jesus said, when you go and you serve, don't expect a thing in return. Don't, don't go serve the ones who's going to give, give, give. Serve the ones who came. I'm here to tell you, when we do that, we build his kingdom, not our kingdom. Never resist an opportunity to be generous. If you have an impulse to be generous or do something, do it. And do it so nobody even knows you did it. Be anonymous. Or do something so that you're just part of a larger group. Maybe somebody, I'm praying somebody in this church says, 720 boxes of macaroni and cheese, we can do that. Let's get it together. I'm waiting for somebody to rise up to do that. I'm waiting for people to say, let's minister to people. Let's not stop with where we are. Let's keep going to, to build His kingdom <coughs> by reaching people who are hurting, who are crippled, who are down and outcast. Because if we can't minister to them, then we need to just quit because we're just a country club. Jesus has asked us to do this, and I thank God that we're in a place, that I'm in a place, I am here, that I see these things going on. So here's what I would encourage you with. You better jump on the bandwagon. You, mean, you need to jump on board and say where... Figure out where you're going to get on board and be part of that. Because that's what Jesus is talking about here is serving others. If you want it a little more pointedly, in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, James' half-brother writes this. He says, he says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? He's even more specific by saying this. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, the writer says this, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, 
if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So I declare today that Jesus is addressing a heart and an attitude where people want it to be about them, and it's not about them. A focused life is this. A God-focused trust and grace will produce more than earthly position and payback. When we focus our trust and grace on God to supply in the midst of a need, then there will be more benefit from that than if we have the highest standing in the community. If we have the greatest investment, none of that compares to investing in God's kingdom. What the law requires is love in action. Love in action, not just appearances. Francis Chan said, I believe he wants us to love others so much that we go to extremes to help them. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Going to the extreme. I don't think it's wrong to invite your family or your friends or your neighbors over to eat. But if you, are, if you do it so that they'll give back to you. See, I'm not raising my kids in hopes that they're going to take care of me when I get old. It would be nice. Especially if Buddy goes to the NFL, that would be a good retirement package. But my goal as a dad is not to invest in them so that they'll take care of me when I get old. I'm not expecting that. Now if they do, praise the Lord. I hope they do. But I'm investing in them because I love them. And if they never give me a thank, I'm still going to give. I'm still going to love them. I'm still going to give to them. I'm still going to be there for them. So I encourage you today to get on board. What should I do? Well, the very first thing I think you need to do is this. You need to choose Christ's attitude first and foremost. Choose Christ's attitude and not your own pious attitude that "Ah, I'm just too good to do that. I just can't get involved in that. Choose the attitude of Christ. Philippians 2 says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interest of others. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Oh, Paul throws this in. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So if we are to have a mind and heart like Christ, we are to serve other people and help those who cannot even give back to us and we get nothing in return. See, Jesus existed in the form of God, but he did not, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped and held on to, but he humbled himself and he came to this earth to live and to die for you and gave up everything just for you. Even though he knew you may give nothing back, he gave it all for you. If you had said no to Jesus, he still would have died for you. Because he was willing to do that. So I encourage you to grab hold of Christ's attitude when it comes to serving other people. The second thing is this, just serve. Just serve. Get involved. Do something. Do it at the grocery store, at the restaurant. You'll never know whose life you may touch. By simply seeing a waitress who's having a really bad day. You know she's a mother, a single mother, working countless hours to try to make ends meet. And somebody's really rude to her and mean and just leaves the restaurant. She doesn't even get a tip from her. And all you pay for is just three or or four dollars for your meal. And God prompts you with the impulse, give her a twenty dollar tip. Give it and walk out. Trust that Jesus Christ will take that and use it for him. God knows the need. And God has chosen you and me to meet the need. And can I tell you that God will supply for whatever need needs to be met. He's going to supply you with it to be able to meet those needs. We have not been blessed in America to build great wealth and great kingdoms here on earth. But God has blessed us so that we can bless other people and help them. 
Never suppress an impulse to be generous because God can use you, your expression of love to someone, to give them a picture of Christ that maybe they have forgotten. So I challenge you today to take the words of Christ as He has told us. Don't seek status from people. Don't exalt yourself. But look for those who can do nothing in return for you and serve them. As we move forward as a church, as we move forward as individuals, with an attitude 